Okay, so we're going to continue with the nervous system. Unfortunately, I'm hoping this is the last day <laughs> on the bathroom. Um, this looks like we have anybody want to speak to Unless they just have an Moodle link. But that could be. <clears throat> have any of you had to go on the Moodle or on the Eugene site to get the tape, the code recording? Okay, I know you're coming to class, and there's really no There's really no need. <laughs> yeah, there's really no need for you to do that because you're coming to class. Um, Danielle, if you're missing parts of it, you could always go on there. Yeah, so and the part that you missed part of the brain last time, oh, and you had to go to work. So you could go on there and just see the rest of it. Um, I'm hoping that the other students that are online are able to get hold of it. So anyways, we'll start with this. Um, the handouts I gave you are... A little bit of everything. There's some for the eye, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's um, some information on the nervous system that I gave out at the end. There is an ear there as well, and if you have them close by, it's probably going to be easier for you to follow later on because we have to go through this somatic nervous system and the um, the automatic, and then at the end part, we start doing the visual and hearing, and that's when it gets more interesting. <laughs> Yay! So I've given you these extra little handles so you could have something to look at when we're talking talking about it, because it just makes it easier to follow if you've got something visual. So you've got beside you. I gave you a poster board. That one I didn't have an elastic floor, so I could roll it up. Um, the poster board, what I'd like you guys to do, if you can, I'll just mark that one off. Make this or get rid of it. Blank. Okay. So what I did was I just kind of summarized what we've done. It's kind of hard to follow up. <clears throat> So it's similar to this one that I handed out to you. It's not yours is a new color, but it's black and white. And you, you have it. No, I didn't hand it out today. I'm sorry. It's in what you, I gave you before, previous. So this is the one I'm talking about for the people that are at home. I'm going to move this around properly. So what I'd like you to do today, you can do it today while we're while we're in class, or you can do it. But I know that you're really busy, so you probably would rather have it done while you're in class. So poster board, I'd like you to do this type of thing on the poster board: your nervous system, your central nervous system, and remember to put the letters in because unfortunately, somewhere in your exams, they just have the letters. So when they're asking you a question, you just put the letters. So just be aware that um, what the letters are are meaning. Because it does get confusing with different things. Probably oh, the CNS thing. Yeah, the CNS, the peripherals to the PNS. And then down here you'll get the somatic, and we're gonna keep doing that right away. And that that one is an S. I just don't want you guys to get confused with those, especially if you're re reading the exam question and you see those letters. I don't. So just be really aware of those. So 
So what is done here is just the central nervous system, the brain, and spinal cord, right? <laughs> Roll that. So the central nervous system, the PNS, is the afferent sensory and the efferent motor. So when we talk about the sensory, it, it takes in information, right? And your afferent motor is the one that sends it out. So I kind of think I remember it this way is that um, efferent is energy, it's effort, it's something you're doing, doing something. Then the autonomic nervous system, the somatic. The autonomic, always remember autonomic is visceral. If you remember autonomic is visceral, then you'll think of the heart and the gut and that type of and then the division of the autonomic is the sympathetic and parasympathetic. We're going to be going through that again today. So what I'd like you to do on your poster board is just, you can do that. You can just write down nervous system. Leave yourself some spaces because what I'd like you to do is while we're talking about this, you can jot down some little notes beside it. So when you're all finished this, you can, do, you can complete it at home as well. I want you to take a pair of scissors and like cut it up <laughs> and make a puzzle out of it. Okay. okay. So the idea with this is if you write it all down and then you cut it up and make a puzzle out of it, you make puzzle pieces. And, I mean, don't make them too little, but make them you know reasonable size. You can do squares or whatever for you. Um, and you have to put it back together. You will learn from putting it back together. Okay, so that's the reason I'm doing this. So that will be a little bit more interesting than just staring at the wall today. <laughs> okay, so we can get started. If you want a little, just want a little bit of time, because we actually have, I don't, I do have people. Oh, Alex and Kadeem are Okay, great. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. So. You guys, Alex, you did really well on your on your exam, by the way, Alex. Thank you for that. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, okay. So I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of time. If you want to grab some um, felt and just kind of do a quick start on it. with the nervous system right now and this is the handout that I've given the other students and if, if you can find it in your Moodle you should be able to find it in your Moodle I'll try to send it to you this weekend after I get home okay. <clears throat> so is it okay if I pull this down and So we're starting out with a somatic nervous system, sensory pathways. So 
So the sensory pathways deliver somatic and visceral sensory information to the final destination, which is inside the scan. And I'm not sure if that's or in control or on earlier, but just to remember to learn what these abbreviations are for, right? Which systems are for. And it's a transit system. So the somatic nervous system motor pathways, this is kind of a, a little bit of a review as well, control the peripheral effectors. And again, you guys see this in red, you know what that means. <laughs> You're going to see it again. Muscular responses. Okay. And I'll let you write that down. Catch up here. Good. Okay. I'm just checking to make sure everything's over going too far. So general senses. It just tells us what's happening in our environment, right? So the temperature of your room, what you what you're handling, um, vibration, meaning um, anything that you pick up, your your cell phone if it's vibrating, that type of thing. Pain and pressure. Again, the process, the proprioception comes from the joints, tendons, muscles, and it's only in the, the, the somatic nervous system. This is just a definition, actually, a quick definition. Sensation, they're adding information from these senses. That's what they use as a definition for the senses. So perception. Music. <laughs> Has somebody got their mic on? Oh, Red's here. Uh, so perception is conscious of awareness of the sensation. So you're consciously aware of what the room temperature is. Um, you know, if you pick up or touch something. So transduction. You don't really have to worry too much about this one. Okay, but it's there just to for your information only. So it's the term used to describe when sensory impulses has been received and interpreted by the Okay. Ah. Special senses? Sensory, I'm sorry. Special sensory I'm ahead of perception receptors are located in sense organs such as the mouth, up of the ears. 
And the important part here is the information is interpreted in specific regions of the cerebral cortex. That means that your eyes and your ears have a special area in the cortex that is devoted just to them. So why do receptors respond to specific stimuli? <laughs> Sensitivity. So they're, like I said before, they're des designed to get specific sensations only. So, you know, an, uh, an example of a specific sensation would be um, if you held an ice cube in your hand, something like that. It's very specific. It's a cold sensation. Free nerve endings. Uh, do you remember the? Photographs or the handout that I gave you that has, and it's in your textbook as well, is a picture of the neuron with the dendrites, the little fingers at the top. Okay, so the branch, the free nerve endings are the branching tips of the dendrites. So those are the little ends of those little, um, it's like little trees, actually. Yeah, little trees. <laughs> and a tree trunk. <clears throat> so they can be stimulated by many different stimuli, and they're not designed to relay specific sensory information. So that's the difference from the one previous. And their example here is a pain sensation may be triggered by pressure, temperature, chemical, or traumatic stimuli. So it's a sensation of pain. Even when you have an itch, if you're itching, actually, if you have like a hive or whatever, that actually is pain, but it just is interpreted as itching. So, yeah. So, when you have patients who are in the hospital who have um, urticaria, which are hives, um, and they're scratching away at them, actually, they need pain control as well as something superficially on their skin. Um, like if they were to take a Tylenol to help with the pain, as well as applying a, um, some kind of a medication like um, cam like um, uh, Benadryl cream or something like that to stop the itching or help with the itching. So they actually are they are perceiving pain, but it's it's being sensed as an itch. So how does the organization of the receptors affect the sensitivity, its sensitivity? Oh, receptive fields. So it's an area that's monitored by a single receptor cell. And you can see the, the little dendrites going up here. In the so the, this makes perfect sense, but you will see this again. These slides are <laughs> The larger the receptive field, the more difficult it is to localize the stimuli. So if you had a rash all over your forearm, it's hard to know exactly where, where the issue is. But if you had one single little mosquito bite, obviously it's easier. So the larger receptive field, the more difficult it is to localize. Do the color coding. 
red. Yeah, red. red. <laughs> okay, tonic receptors. They're always active. Um, let me think how I can use this. Let me explain the tonic part. Tonic is almost like your muscles that are in a tonic situation, which means they are tense. They're always active, and those muscles are the ones that keep your posture, right? You have to have some muscle activity to keep your posture. So that's when the word tonic comes in. So they're always active, <clears throat> and they're constantly telling the CMS what's going on. And your posture is a good example of that. You always have to have some kind of neurological stimulation to keep your posture upright or with your sitting or whatever you're doing. The other one they use as an example here is the lungs as well. Or stuff that are kept open. But they are always kept open, but they do exhale and inhale. But they're usually, they're still open. Oh God, this is all red. <laughs> Labeled line, a nerve that carries a specific sensation to the cerebrum. And I know with this course, there's lots of words that are very similar, like cerebellum and cerebrum, but just make note that it's the cerebrum. Okay. So the, the term that they use to describe the link between the peripheral sensory receptor and the CNS receptor. And it consists of axions carrying a specific sensory message like pain, a specific, that's pain is a good one to think of. The CNS interprets the information based on the line over which the sensory information arrives on, not the sensation itself. Trying to think of an example. So if you perceive a flashing light, it's perceived as the light flashing, but it's not really a sensation. It's just it's a visual, if you can follow what I mean. And then they say also with these label lines, sometimes they get true and false sensations. You don't have to worry about this, it's just for your information. So you may see flashing light which aren't there, or shadows that aren't there. And it's a perception that you best are getting. And I don't know if you've ever experienced peripheral vision on the side where you think you see a shadow, but it's really not there. And that's what's happening with this. Sometimes getting a wee bit confused. <laughs> call that Casper. Yeah, that's right. You can call it Casper, that's true. <laughs> So sensory coding. So it interprets the strength and duration in the impulses or the action potentials, I guess we just call them. And it allows the body to respond appropriately to the stimulus. So if you had just put your hand in a bowl of warm water, you wouldn't withdraw it right away. It would be a pleasant sensation, probably. Had you put your hand in a bowl of hot water, 
you would it would tell you that you're going to hurt yourself burn yourself so the strength and duration variation would be different between warm water and hot water the best way i can describe it and then you would respond appropriately by pulling your hand out of the hot water and maybe enjoying the warm water <laughs> Adaptation. Now I have to correct this one. So it's a reduction sensitivity to a of a constant stimulus. Remember the other day I told you that when I take my blood sugar, I don't feel it anymore. I have adapted to the fact I take it six times a day. When I give my insulin, I don't feel it anymore either. But then when I'm sewing and making my Halloween costume. <laughs> I accidentally poked my finger with the needle and oh, I, I reacted immediately, even though it was on the same fingers that I use for taking my blood sugars. So adaptation does happen. Um, they're talking here about the central, which is a fast adaptation, which means you go to the swimming pool and you jump in the hot tub. It's hot, but you become quickly adapted to it and it's comfortable. The humming of the fan is something I can't do. I hate the fan. <laughs> I, I don't adapt to that. <laughs> and peripheral, they're talking about slow ad adaptation, peripheral pain receptors. Slow adaptation, people can, um, if they have chronic pain, uh, oftentimes there's chronic pain clinics, there's different things. They do adapt to the pain and learn to live with it, but it still exists. Now the generalized adaptation syndrome, they thought, yeah, it's so short, but I have a big thing with, with <coughs> shortening words down because I think they just get the sympathetic nervous system is activated for a long time. Your sympathetic nervous system is your, do you remember? What does it do for you? The sympathetic. You got it on the tip of your tongue. I saw you say it. Fight and flight. That one. <laughs> yeah, repeat it. So this one, if it's activated for over a long period of time, it could be quite dangerous, right? If you constantly are in a state of fight and flight, you have an elevated blood pressure, elevated respirations, um, tachycardia or fast heart rate. So this can be dangerous to people. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Cortisol, cord yeah. Okay, are we good there? Oh, right, yeah, okay, cool. Do you want to explain them? <laughs> right. Uh, this is good. Well, let me review them. We didn't beat them to it this time. Why don't you tell me what else you took the class? <laughs> so, classification of sensory receptors, they're divided into four types due to the nature of the stimulus. So you have no sleep no, no receptors, sorry, are pain, and thermal is temperature. Mechanical, I always think of like mechanics, right? So that means like the moving part. So that's how I remember the mechanical receptors. So it's a physical action. And then it's divided again into the baroreceptors, tactile, and the proprioceptors. Chemoreceptor is a chemical concentration. And I believe the next slide has more information on that. These baroreceptors are important when you're giving medications because they affect blood pressure and so forth. So you'll when you take your pharmacology, 
they're going to refer to those. You'll hear the instructor talk about those. Okay. Um, So the pain receptors, which are on your list there, and the receptors. So they're in the superficial and the joint capsules, the bone, and the walls of blood vessels. And you remember from your previous class with the periosteum, the outer where the nerve supply is at the one. Again, they're talking about the free nerve bending. Remember there on the dendrites. And we've just kind of covered this already with the large receptive fields, and it's hard to localize the pain when we're in a large field. So your nose receptors are sensitive to extremes, temperature, mechanical balance, and dissolved chemicals, such as chemicals released by injured cells. So when you talk about chemicals released by injured cells, remember the CKP? Um, are damage in muscle cells that release a chemical, and they can test the blood for that. And also your troponins, which are from your heart muscle being damaged as well. So they're sensitive to that. Type A and type C fibers. Again, like we said, in red, let's see it again. Um, relay painful sensation. <laughs> the A fibers are on the fast track. <laughs> They are the fast pain. They can be caused by you as a nurse not giving the injection properly or <laughs> from the external environment. Is that like a paper clip too? Yeah, like a paper clip. Anything that's fast and you respond quickly to that, if you poke yourself with a needle. That's fast pain, right? You respond immediately. They trigger a somatic reflex. And we talked about reflexes. They're quick. Yeah. And I actually handed handed you out a um, on the reflex arc. There it is. One here. I just photocopied it and handed this out because you, Brenda, you had a question about that last 
Yeah. yeah, the reflexes are don't go up to the brain. They actually go into the spinal cord and back out again. Yeah. So they don't, they're very fast, very quick. And I'll just show so some class. Has a stroke in their hands or had a stroke in their hands and came out. <coughs> That's a dip, that's because the stroke originates in the brain. It's not originating from the environment, right? From the external environment. So they wouldn't feel it in that way. Okay. They would they would have a sensation of numbness if it's a stroke. They don't really feel pain. Uh, so we're okay with this. Good. So this is a slower pain or burning and aching pain from the viscera. Now, if you have, when you describe slow pain from the viscera, you're thinking of, think of like gastric distension. If you have the bowel is really distended, it's a kind of a slower pain and a nagging pain. Um, it's not a quick, and needs a quick response. The other one would be, um, say, gallstones. That's a slow pain, it lasts a long time, and you're not getting a quick response to it. So with this, you become aware of the pain, but if you had gallstones, you would have pain, you know, sort of here and in your back and possibly up between your shoulder blades. It wouldn't be restricted to that tiny little area where the gallstones are. Now, this follows into referred pain. And gallstones are a good example. Um, also, cardiac pain. If you have are having chest pain, you have the pressing, crushing pain in the center of your chest usually. But also, you're getting referred pain to the shoulder, down the left arm, and possibly up into your jaw as well. <clears throat> Just let you have that. My allergies are coming back to mind. <coughs> and you've reviewed the interneuron before in other classes or the previous class. So the interneuron stimulates the primary sensory cortex of the brain. So an individual feels pain in that area of the body other than the location of the primary stimulus. Uh, appendix is a good one as well because you can have lower right quadrant pain that is referred up to the umbilicus, like right to the tongue. And if you press on the appendix, if it is inflamed and release, you'll get a pain up into the shoulder sometimes. So there are those referred pains. Oh, we just on the uh, PowerPoint what I just said. With the heart attack, you can get left arm or jaw pain. So they have the liver gallbladder pain that goes up into the shoulder. Heart pain that is up into the jaw down the left arm, appendix, that's right here, <clears throat> sorry, 
to be able to do the stomach and sometimes into the shoulder too. Ureters, if you have um, calculi in your kidney and they are coming down the ureters, so these stones are coming down, you can get referred pain into the groin. <clears throat> thermal receptors, that's easy to remember that because it's obviously got temperature in it, thermal. So there's three nerve endings again. And easy because we already studied the intake of entries in the dermis. Skeletal muscles, liver, and hypoplasma. <clears throat> They're conducted along the same pathway that carry pain sensation and they're sent to the thalamus. Mechanoreceptors. The sensitive stimuli that distorts the cell membranes of the nerve. So that would be um, again maintaining the tone, would help maintain the tone of the body by stretching with that type of thing. So it's muscle, it would help with muscle tone. So it also contains mechanically regulated ion channels whose gates close and open in response to stretching, compression, twisting, and distortion of the membrane. Try to give a good example of that. I can't really think of anything that sort of says it all right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's self explanatory. <clears throat> the classes. Of the mechanoreceptors, the tactile receptors, touch, pressure, and vibration. Touch tells you about um, the softness of something. Petting your cat or dog <laughs> would tell you about the texture of their fur and how soft they are. Pressure sensations are when you pick up an object, you know exactly how much pressure you have to put on the sides of a box to lift it. Right? Your brain tells you how much pressure you need. And the vibration sensations. The perfect one would be taking somebody's pulse, right? That's a vibration, and you can feel that.
Three classes that we're going to continue with baroreceptors, and this is the one that I said earlier that we're going to talk about again. They detect blood pressure changes in the walls of the blood vessels and in portions of the digestive, reproductive, and urinary tracts. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, the reason those are so important is a lot of the chemicals or medications that you're giving patients have been developed using the baroreceptors. The proprietor receptors, they monitor position of the joints and muscles. So they're telling you when you're walking, running, what position those joints and muscles are in. And it says here the most structurally and functionally complex of the general sensory receptors. And that's understandable. I mean, if it's monitoring how you're walking, what you're doing, that's taking a lot of sensory um, input. Fine touch and pressure receptors. Well, it makes sense that they have, are sensitive and they have a narrow receptive field. <clears throat> and for someone like myself, who is, does a lot of painting and artwork, these are the ones that I'm really interested in because any of the artwork that I do is going to be affected if you're doing any type of pottery or sculpturing. You need to know all these things. What what is the texture of the clay? What's the shape? Um, that type of thing. Again, the baroreceptors, you can see how important these are. <laughs> they keep repeating it. <laughs> so they monitor change in pressure. Um, consists of the free nerve endings that we talked about it. They detect the stretch. Um, so if you have a full bladder, it would detect that you have a full bladder and that maybe you should be running the washroom. Uh, that type of thing. Um, if your blood pressure is high, then it will detect the pressure in the vessel as the blood goes through because it's stretching it further every time the heart contracts. It's pushing that blood through and because the blood volume is higher with blood, high blood pressure, it's expanding those vessels. <clears throat> So respond immediately to a change in pressure, but adapt rapid, rapidly. So when you take your pharmacology, you'll be able to tell your pharmacology instructor all about their receptors. <laughs> Chemo receptors, these are interesting ones. They, re they respond to um, Water soluble or lipid soluble, fat soluble, fat soluble substances dissolved in the fluid. And this is where you come into doing blood gases in patients. You know, if they have a low pH or they have a low um, CO2 level, carbon dioxide, they can do those blood gases. So the chemoreceptors respond to blood, blood gases. And your taste buds. So anything that's in a fluid form, we 
which will be most of your food once you've chewed it mixed with saliva so it's in a fluid form the chemoreceptors will pick up the taste Now, somatic sensory pathways. Well, you know, it's part of our, our system over here, which is somatic. Right down there. <laughs> they carry information from the skin and musculature of the body, wall, head, neck, and limb. Motor commands are issued by the CNS and distributed by the somatic nervous system, the SNS, for this guy. Automatic or autonomic, autonomic nervous system is the AMS. So the SNS is the um, somatic nervous system controls contractions of the skeletal muscle. The ANS, the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic one, controls the visceral system, which is your heart and your stomach and all those inside. So you can kind of remember with this SNS, it's S like in skeletal. That might help you to remember it a little bit. And the autonomic or automatic is what I think of it as. Or anything that it's running automatically, like your heart muscle, or um, let's say your intestines, that type of thing. <laughs> so the somatic nerve motor pathways always involve at least two motor neurons, the upper and lower motor neuron. <clears throat> the upper cell body lies in the CNS processing center. And the lower motor, motor neuron cell body lies in the nucleus, the brain stem or spinal cord. <clears throat> the upper motor neuron synapses on the lower motor neuron and innervates a single motor unit in the skeletal muscle. So the upper and lower are working together to facilitate or inhibit the action the activity.
The lower, the lower one triggers, triggers the contraction in the innervated muscle. Only axion of the lower motor neuron extends the outside of the CNN. So there's talking about damage here, which is just more information. Sort of, this is nice to know, but you don't have to. Okay. <laughs> it's nice to know, but need to know. Well, <laughs> Matic motor commands, several centers in the cerebrum, the diencephalons, and the brainstem. May issue somatic motor commands. So these processes are are processes performing at a subconscious level rather than a conscious level. So if you're walking, you're not really consciously thinking of walking, you're just going from A to B, so, but you're not thinking, oh, I have to take a step, I have to move this muscle, that type of thing. That's what they're meaning by performing at a subconscious level. Yeah, um, you're, yeah, the breathing is, is um, an auto, an auto, actually it's autonomic, so, yeah, that's an autonomic one. But the muscles are involved, the diaphragm is involved. Basal nuclea and cerebellum. Responsible <laughs> for coordination and feedback control over muscle contraction. So, whether they're subconscious or conscious, whether you are throwing a ball with the conscious one, you're thinking about what you're doing, or whether you're walking. I'm going to switch to the other set of slides, which is the autonomic nervous system. And hopefully, I can do that. We'll see how successful I am.
<laughs> so neural integration, chapter 14 in your big textbook that you have, the autonomic nervous system and higher order function. <clears throat> So if you're doing the Cornell notes, you can just put that at the top of the page and that would be your title. <laughs> yeah, right at the top. When you flip through looking for it, you'll know where it is. So how is it how is the autonomic different from the somatic? You can have a look at that. So the review are the efferent nervous system. This is just a review, we've already gone through this. So the thematic nervous system mainly op operates the conscious control. The vectors are, um, are skeletal muscles. The autonomic operates automatically. There's an easy way to remember autonomic and automatic, so easy. Um, the effectors are organs, glands, smooth muscles. And then just to electrolytes, nutrients, and dissolved gases. So we talked about um, the gases already, the CO2 level in body fluids. So you just ask about respiratory, right, when you breathe. So it is an autonomic. Um, Somatic of the review again, the sensory input is received from the periphery, motor responses are initiated. And the motor command is generally by the primary motor cortex, motor cortex of the brain. So if you can remember the motor response, the motor cortex, that'll help you in your study. I'll just let the student that one have a read of that. <laughs> Friday, Friday? 14th. Oh, it's no, 14th. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's one, one o'clock on the 14th. Because we have the blood to do yet, and that's on the exam. We'll have a few things to do yet. Oh, well, and the thing is, I also left it late because I thought you'd have a week to study. Because otherwise, you wouldn't have any time to study. Yeah. It would be like we take the course when you write the exams. And not, not I'll leave you time to <laughs> So this re review terms, pre-ganglionic. So the neurons are inside the brain and spinal cord. The post-ganglionic, they're outside the brain and spinal cord. So the autonomic nervous system, <clears throat> AMS. <laughs> when the sensory input is received from the viscera, the motor response is initiated. So our sensory input would be hunger. So if we're hungry, the autonomic nervous system would actually start the stomach producing different enzymes and acids and so forth to digest your food. You may have um, smelled a really nice smell, um, apple pie or something. The, the autonomic nervous system would start making your Saliva flow, right? So it makes your stomach growl. Is that the same thing, or it's a, it's a stimulation um, of lowering of your blood sugar for to make your stomach growl, and also odors, and also if you're chewing gum, that's really bad for that because the stomach actually thinks it's going to get some food, so it becomes activated because you're chewing the gum. And you start putting out all the acids and all the enzymes that you need to digest, but then it doesn't get anything. Yeah. And it gets upset and it starts growling because it doesn't get anything. Okay. So motor response is generated by preganglion neurons in the hypothalamus. This is a very busy page, it's got a lot of red on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
most the most pre-game neurons in the ANS are part of the visceral reflex arch, the cranial reflex arch, and are not under direct control of the hypothalamus. So the set she writes right is down. Sorry, I'm going to have to just push it back. Still can't see it. <laughs> so I'm just trying to adjust this a bit. Yeah, we need to gather. <laughs> that camera sits right in the way. Eh? Yeah, you have to look like around it. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's too bad. If I had it lower, then I can't get everything yeah. on the screen. Did you provide your glasses, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I shouldn't tease you. <laughs> glasses. Yeah. Oh, I love Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, dude. I'll describe the security guard. Oh, he'll let he's very yeah. he's very nice. He let yeah. us into the lab the other day. Yeah. We were there were some people who were interested in taking the course and he came and <clears throat> So the autonomic nervous system is just discontinued because we couldn't get, I can get all the information on one slide. So there's more here. So they congregate in bunches called autonomic ganglia. So the axioms of the autonomic ganglia, post ganglionic fibers. Innervate organs and, of course, all your sleeping muscles, your heart. So the medic medication advances affecting the autonomic nervous system, the antihypertensives, decrease blood pressure, motility drugs, slow the emptying of the gastric contents, and medications that control the, the heart rate and rhythm. 
and birth control pills as well. You're, you're going to see all these again in your pharmacology course, so it's okay if you want to write them down. Ah, good. So, did they talk about ferroreceptors? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Get that later, maybe. Well, you're just at the beginning. I think it's pretty, yeah. You're doing classifications right now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So later on, you'll get more information. So they're talking about now what is the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system? <laughs> And as always, try and remember sympathetic as fight or flight, and your body's in sympathy with you because something's chasing you. So, the gorilla, I think it was last mm -hmm. time. We had a gorilla last yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's the way I remember sympathetic is my body's in sympathy with the situation that I'm in, a stressful situation. So what happens when you have this initiated, if you have a stressful situation initiated, it's something that you guys are all very accustomed to. I mean, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure, we will, you might feel your blood pressure because you get flushed in the face. You may perspire more. And your body reduces urinary and digestive activity. Because if you were being chased by a gorilla, you wouldn't have time to run to the washroom. So. Your body stops all that and just allows you to run away. <clears throat> so the pregame fibers originate in the thorax and the lumbar region of the spinal cord. They synapse near the spinal cord, which would make sense because if you're running away, you want things to happen very quickly. So the shortest distance, so they snaps near the spinal cord. The pre ganglion fibers are within CNS and they're short. The posts are longer. They're outside the central nervous system. That, if you think about it, that kind of makes sense too, because the input that you want from the gorilla chasing you, you want it very quickly, right? So a shorter fiber. The output would be your response as to run away. So it would be on a longer, longer fiber. The parasympathetic division. So it returns the body to homeostasis, right back to your resting and relaxed phase. And you, most of the time, you're in under control of the parasympathetic because most of the time we are fairly relaxed. We're not running away. We don't have to have our heart rate up. <coughs> so it balances you back out again after your stressful situation. So your heart rate and blood pressure return to normal and your digestive activity and urinary um, elimination would be increased because now you, know, you would have time if you needed to go to the washroom, you could. Did you slap me? Yeah. Today, yesterday, you're doing the exam. Yes. And he held his he held his pee throughout the exam. Uh -huh. And then by the time he was getting to do this, he shared with us. Yeah. He was going to the bathroom, he got to the bathroom, he forgot he had a classroom. So oh. he's <laughs> got the whole lounge around and he's trying to go pee. And he's trying to a different part and he realized he didn't have to. And then he's standing there and he's shocked his body. He's like trying to hold his pee and then he's just putting off his stuff. This was had fun yesterday. Yeah, it was. Oh, that's good. 
I love how we the kids were so cute last night. They were so cute. Are we good? Yeah. Oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, that I like that. <laughs> Makes the class more interesting because you know, like, oh, the one is boring. <laughs> so, we just did that one on the stage. Okay. The adrenal medulla. Ah, oh, great. The adrenal glands. Okay. We're going to be going on to glands later, too, when we do the endocrine system. So, you guys will hear this again. So the preglandular fibers enter the adrenal medulla. <clears throat> it's the interpretive center within the adrenal glands, which are located on top of the kidneys. Now, like I said, you can see this again, so don't be too concerned about it. They synapse with neuroendocrine cells. That secrete your epinephrine, norepinephrine, which are your flight and fight hormones, and dopamine, which is the baby hormone that you'll find lacking in Parkinson's. The vagus wandering nerve. Now, when I was reading about this, I go like wandering, what do you mean by that? <laughs> so I looked it up and it's just that there's a lot of fibers. It's, it's actually an extensive nerve that covers a lot of space. Um, so that's what they meant by wandering because it's, it's, it has all these fibers that kind of go all over the place. So it's a mixed cranial nerve that has motor and sensory roots, both. So it's the only cranial nerve that starts in the brain stem and extends into the chest and abdomen. And I think that's where they get the wandering part. So it starts and it extends all over. But it's the only one that does that. Controls lungs, heart, stomach, liver, pancreas, and the largest ball of the time. When you work, if you work in the emergency department, often you'll have people come in with a vagal response sometimes and they've collapsed. And it's from this nerve. Some stimulus has happened within this nerve and they collapse. Um, you can also get a vagal vagal response and you can throw the carotid arteries to lower people's blood pressure and you can also um, help regulate your heart rate by doing that. It also has that effect. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. Yeah, and then of course it's frightening because you think they've had a heart attack or whatever, yeah. but that's what it is. Um, sometimes just pushing when they're having a bowel movement can cause this to happen, and they can pass out. And it's fairly frequent. You see, the basal response is um, also to do with vomiting as well. So people can vomit a lot and then pass out because of the vagus nerve. So that can happen too. <clears throat> it's essential in returning the body to the rest and just hold stage after the initial fight or flight response as well. So it's involved in returning us to a relaxed state. The other thing I've noticed, I don't know if you guys have noticed, I put some of the cranial nerves, I put up there, cranial nerve 10. You can see those, um, the cranial nerves are on your exam. So I handed out this one here. Uh, hang on, that's my Yeah, this one here. So this has all the different cranial nerves on it. And it's from one of my other textbooks. So I would have to send that to the other students. So I we can see this. But it's just a nice compact. It's kind of easy to follow. It does have the cranial nerves on it. Okay. This 
a diagram, and that's in your, I believe this one's in your textbook. I think it is. Do you recognize this one? Of the different, um, where the vagus nerve is, where it's located, and how, what organs it attached to or connected to, I should say. <clears throat> so you can see it has a lot of work to do. When you look at the list of things that it's involved in, it's a pretty important nerve. <clears throat> divisions of the automatic work together. There's two divisions. Two divisions may work together independently, and two divisions may work together. They work independently or together. But on the bottom here, you'll see most organs are duly innervated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. And that's quite, would make sense if your heart rate is affected by your sympathetic and it raises your heart rate, you would have to have some kind of innervation from the parasympathetic to drop your heart rate back down. So this is quite logical. And I can think of myself, when I get nervous, my stomach gets upset. So for me, I would have to have the, par the uh, parasympathetic to relax my stomach again. Eight, 10 more minutes until break. <laughs> you make it that long yet? Acetylcholine. You're going to see acetylcholine a lot. <laughs> we talked about it before in the nerve synapses, remember? And also, you'll see it frequently throughout your nursing, especially pharmacology. <clears throat> the ACH, just remember that. So it's a neurotransmitter in central and peripheral nervous system. And it's for the cholinergic neuron. And easy enough to remember because the cell of choline has cholinergic, like part of the word is, is the same. So it helps you to remember how it works. <clears throat> so the cholinergic neuron innervates smooth muscle skeletal muscle, heart, and ganglia and bone. So they're involved just about in everything, right? I can't think of much that they've missed. <laughs> so acetylcholine is present in all neuromuscular and neuroglandular junctions. And they're talking about those synaptic junctions, remember? From the dendrites and the neurons. So any drug or medication that you would be giving can affect acetylcholine, especially your painkillers, right? that type of thing. So like I say, you're going to hear a lot about this um, neurotransmitter when you're taking the pharmacology. There's lots of drugs that affect it. That should be a good reference for you guys to remember as well, because if you know what acetylcholine does, then you're going to be able to do your pharmacology and know what the response is going to be. It's, it's easier to learn that if you know what this does.
So instead of calling it continue more information, this enzyme that destroys it is called acetylcholinesterase. And again, have a look at these letters to see how they're set up. There's a small, there's a small H and then a E on the edge. I'm a little bit worried that you will get that on an exam and you won't know what one you're talking about. It just differentiates with that E. You remember the neuron cell we had pictures and the, the, the acetylcholine came down, was brought down from the, the cell body and traveled all the way down to the synaptic knob, and then was used to go across that synaptic membrane. <clears throat> no, it's kind of nice to have reviews. <laughs> I'm wondering if we should take our break now before we yeah. start something new. So that this is the next step here. So I think we'll leave that for later. So anybody at home who is just break time, <laughs> we'll be back in about 20 minutes. So 20 minutes after two. That's a little bit slow now. Okay, so 20 minutes after two, we'll come back. That might be needed in this one, is it? difficult. Well, even the the people that haven't done their exams, like, yeah. or, or just do their quiz, yeah. I'm thinking, well, maybe it wasn't, they did them, and then it just didn't get downloaded properly. Yeah. So now I have to check with, with every person to see if they've done them or not. So we'll have to email everybody and just see. 
Because I don't know if it's the technology that's not working or if they have, just haven't got around to doing it. I'm so sorry. And I said, what are you sorry for? I said, it's not on you, it's on me. 
which is the kind of quality of my people who can be born. You can see that I just want to hug her. You know, to me, it's like you just want to protect her. I know. Yeah. Oh, she's so cute. She is. I mean, the more I seem to try to avoid her, the more she's like her body. I wonder how she did all that pharmacology. That's true. I know, right? Yeah. I was just so happy that I could ask because that was the one that was like, this was like steak. And then I bought it. <laughs> like the relief in my whole body. Like you can see. Did you have to get like well above me? Oh, yeah, it's the fact that we had to be above me. I was like, oh, thank God. I, I didn't want her to be shocked when I was like, no, this is not this is not that I have to cry and be hard. And this is hard for some to be around, but I put myself in that place because I knew that somebody else was doing it. And just the rewriting it, I think, and being in a group with other people helps. Yeah. But I didn't think it would because to me, she was so loud that it's hard. But it's almost challenging myself. Like, are you being like this? Yeah. So that was hard. It's hard to be alone. She talks to us. I know. I'm happy she stopped talking to me again. Me too. Like, I'm really sick. When I put that headphones in, it helps. Like it's more just a block, right? It was yeah. like a block where we had their music on. But I think that helped too is because I wasn't so focused on my anxiety that I was able to focus on what was happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, even yesterday, writing that really massive down. Yeah. Um, they had they started bringing in all the little kids. 
and they're from Illinois, and they're from Denver, they're just like the party of the city, they're from mm -hmm. Illinois, and they're from Denver. Yeah, because you can see it where you want to go. I could, I could just hear them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a kid, so it's like this is where the world is here, so I'm just going to go. I'm not a fan of kids anyway, yeah. so like just listening to them hurts mm -hmm. me. <laughs> yeah, I'm all that. Mm -hmm. It's true. <coughs> it was funny yesterday. I was like, I got home and I'm like tired and I forgot to grab hand for the kids for trick or treat. And all of a sudden there's like bang, 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 bang on my phone. And I was like, bang, 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 and I'm like, still go away. And I'm like, then there's another bang and it's like not going away. And my ex and my daughter don't do hell, we don't get a rate. I'm like, all about home. But I'm like, I have nothing. And I'm like, oh, they're not going to go away. I had a big box of um, granola bars and a big box of fruit, um, fruit cups. So then I grabbed those and went down there and then I'm like, hello, because it was my niece and my nephew, right? So they're like, your car's home, the truck's home, you're home, we know you're home. So I answered the door, right? <laughs> and then they're like, trick or treat, I'm like, I love you guys. And then I gave them their stuff and they're all happy. And then they go, and then the second batch, so it's like bang down, so there's like another day, right? I'm like, that's not what you guys are saying. And you see that you right because you're at my door and you're like bang on the like, Oh no, they're like, it's my birthday, Auntie. I'm like, happy birthday to tell me that he's like um Halloween and he just turned 13. He's like, turn 13, you're a I'm a teenager. I'm like, oh happy birthday. And it's like you have to roll the trees and they're like, thank you, Auntie. And then they're like, I said, probably next year I'm gonna make sure I buy you. Trick-or-treat stuff because like they were all happy with what they got. It was just like going back and just like healthy is supposed to be a little candy and witty, right? But it's not healthy stuff. So it's like oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then I got to my third and thirteenth like oh my god. Wow. And we always do like um but all these like animated things that go off the stage the kids kind of get up on the porch and like, so we had about seven criers last night. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> I must be I love holding for the kids. Yeah. Like, I love seeing their little costumes and them making noise and all that. But because I wasn't there last year, I think I was like, oh, that's my kids. And then this year before, I think I had both of them got kids. And because my phone and the next team can help me out together, there's like nobody at the door. So oh, they had all the lights off and everything, right? So nobody would come. But I thought that's sad because I love them, like I want them to come, right? <laughs> Did I promise not be teaching this year, eh? Uh, no, she just had a baby. Did I get the grip? Did she? I didn't even know she just had a baby. Yeah, she may. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Aw. I think she had a girl, too, didn't she? Did she? Well, she said she's like, I want to match mine with another boy. I know what to do with them. Yeah. <laughs> Girls do that. Well, I mean, it's not so much being a bad thing, it's just like, well, she didn't go to her photography class, which is like the mom who just gets her And little things like that. But I look at her and I'm like, you know what, you're not hurting anybody else but yourself by not going. And I said, I'm not mad at you because I can't really say much because I skipped out myself. So it's like getting mad at her, but by telling her that she's only hurting herself and her feelings, she's like, oh. I said, you're not protecting me, you're, you're bad. They're not hurting us. You're hurting your own grades. You know, if you think about your own grades and what you're doing with yourself and your school, then you better look at what you're doing. Like, okay. I said, because if you want to go to the University of Arizona, you can't go there with your grades that you're getting. 
Why when I when I left here we do my exam and I only got like ten questions in and then they're like hey closing time time to get out I'm like are you kidding me like really like I just started my exam and they're like oh and I was like what the hell and I had no time because like I had to and she's like well you can just make it as once you exit out you're done she's like that's the hard part and she's like oh 
Yes, yeah, and that's what I want you to be careful of when you write the exam. You guys get your chocolate that your break. <laughs> yeah, that's super <pretty> good. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me? Banana. She left her banana behind. She's like, she left her banana. Boy, she's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> that's okay. It was more for the effect than eating it. <laughs> so you knew why I had the banana. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I said, and I said to Brenda, I said, you'll never look at a banana. Yeah. Every time you see bananas, it's going to be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> there are snaps. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well done with this guy. It's continued. The bloodstream carries the epinephrine and norepinephrine. The adrenergic neurotransmitters target the organs within the CNS and PNS, therefore, substances elicit a widespread. I think it's the widespread that you're looking at because it's, it's throughout the whole blood system <clears throat> so that it, it can affect the flight and fight <coughs> in a lot of different organs, right? So it's affecting the fight and flight in your heart, your lungs. Your muscle tissue, and that's in delivering it in the bloodstream is much more effective than trying to stimulate it throughout the body on nerves. And we talk about uh, the flight and fight. Also, we have to remember that these are the same chemicals that are produced with stress. And that's why stress is so hard on the body, because stress increases your heart rate and your blood pressure. And you know a lot of people that have high blood pressure. First thing the doctor would say to them, well, what's your stress level? Like, are you working too hard? You're not getting enough rest? Um, that type of thing. So. It is, it does affect us even though we don't realize it. We're under stress like you guys are today. Um, we've got exams coming up, we've got work to do. So you're at a level that's a little bit higher, a uh, stress level. So your blood pressures and your heart rate might, might be up a little bit above normal. Hey guys, this is one of the things that I should be great. That's great blood pressure. <laughs> It that is. Me out. Like, oh no, no, no! You'll find a lot of um, athletes, people that are athletic.